Hi guys, Kaiser here. Hope you're all having a great day out there. You already know that I'm a big Age of Empires 2 fan, but I also really enjoy Age of Empires 3. In fact, AoE 3 was one of the very first games that I ever played online. I wasn't terribly good back then, but I had a blast playing comp stomps with people. Anyway, fast forward to the present day, and I've had an awesome time learning the meta and the mechanics of Age of Empires 2. There's so many good resources online for learning how to get good at the game, how to understand build orders and unit counters and civilization differences. But what I've discovered is, if you're an Age of Empires 2 player, Age of Empires 3 can be pretty daunting. There are way more moving pieces, and the underlying meta, the game behind the game, can be way harder to see and appreciate in Age of Empires 3. It doesn't help that, while there are some fantastic content creators for Age 3, no one has quite yet captured that lightning in a bottle that T90 or Spirit of the Law have for Age of Empires 2, nor are there the kinds of resources like Capture Age or the Interactive Build Order Guide that make learning the game easy. So what I want to do in this video is introduce the unique aspects and some of the metagame of Age of Empires 3 from the perspective of someone who already has a decent grasp of how Age 2 works. I'm not going to go over the specifics of particular build orders, and I'm also not going to share advice that would already be deeply familiar to us Age of Empires 2 players, like keep your town center producing villagers. But instead, we're just going to look at the different mechanics of the game and introduce them in order to help see, as Age 2 players, how Age of Empires 3 works. Okay, so normally for a video on this channel, I would go multiplayer and the rank ladder, but for introducing the game, I figured it would be worthwhile to do a comp stomp. So, let's go ahead and dive in here, and I'm going to set... Uh, let's see, that's Imperial Age. Difficulty will be standard. I'm going to give myself a couple extra resources. Game speed is medium. Let's go. Alright, I'm going to set up my opening moves here. I'm going to queue up some villagers. And the villas that I currently have are gathering my starting resources from these various crates. I've got an explorer, which is basically my scout. And I'm going to send him around to explore part of the map. And... Let's go ahead and dive in here uh, as the early goes going. Let's talk about the differences between AoE 2 and AoE 3. I think when you're analyzing the games, we can maybe split them in half between an economic side and a military side. So let's talk economy first. And I think that maybe one of the biggest differences between Age 2 and Age 3 is in Age of Empires 3, Timing is everything, and opportunities for these timing attacks to gain military or economic advantages are everywhere. Now, I hear you. You're probably saying, hey, Kaiser, what are you talking about? In Age of Empires 2, timing is really important, too. And you're right, it is. Uh, but it's not quite the same. In Age of Empires 2, you might have one or two you know, really big timing attack moments depending on the civilization you choose. Like, for example, uh, as the Byzantines, you know, you may have a cheaper Imperial Age technology, so you can hit the Imperial Age faster and get trebuchets out sooner and try to win the game that way. Or as the Magyars, uh, because you get the uh, Blacksmith melee attack upgrades as soon as you tech up, there are these brief periods of time where your scouts are better than anybody else's, or where your knights might be better than anybody else's. And so, you want to take advantage of that window of opportunity to win the game off of that moment, right? But in Age of Empires 3, that kind of thing is all over the place, and it's not just found in the civilization you choose. For example, uh, you know, I've got my explorer moving around, and he is finding spread out across the map these treasure camps, right? And each of the treasures, they've got some kind of reward to them. Like this one here has 40 food. Now it's got a wolf guarding it, so I've got to send my explorer over and take out this wolf. But once I take out the wolf, the 40 food is mine for the taking. Now, I gave myself a bunch of extra resources at the start of this game, so 40 food here, or... 50 gold there, 50 wood here, doesn't seem like it means a lot. 
but in a normal game where you don't have all these bonus resources, they would absolutely define your early moves, your opening strategy, and therefore the course of the game. You know, you might say, hey, I found 50 gold so I can afford an early economic technology that I otherwise couldn't. Or uh, I found wood so I can afford a trading post faster than I otherwise would be able to. These treasure camps can absolutely make or break your game. And uh, that's, a, that's a huge part of what the early game is all about, is finding the camps, seeing how many you can take, which ones are going to be most important, which ones that you focus on. Um, you know, you're going to be fighting, of course, with your opponent, who's also got his own explorer out trying to get uh, the treasures too. So trying to claim as many treasures as you can and getting the right treasures for the right situations, that's going to be really important, right? Or how about this? What about teching up to the next age? Now, in Age of Empires 2, it is rare to have a bonus associated with teching up. Uh, you might count that Magyar bonus as one, or another one might be the Ethiopians. I think they're the closest example to what we've got here, where uh, every time you tech up as the Ethiopians, you get 100 gold and 100 wood, right? It's a nice bonus. But that's kind of rare in the Age of Empires 2 world. Well, in Age of Empires 3... Uh, let me back him up. In Age of Empires 3... Every civilization has not just an Ethiopian-style bonus, but multiple possible bonuses based on which one you prefer. What do I mean by that? Well, let's take a look. Right now we're in Age 1, the Exploration Age. If I click the button to go up to Age 2, you will see that I actually have a choice of five different politicians, and each politician has a different bonus associated with him or her. So, for example, we have the Quartermaster here. He's got 400 wood. So if I select this politician, maybe I want to do something like a crossbow rush. And that extra wood would be huge, right? Or maybe I want to do a scout rush. And the Philosopher Prince with his 500 food would be really, really useful, right? Or what if I want to do some kind of economic boom? Well, maybe an extra settler wagon and two more cows could be really useful economically, right? Or the logistician. You notice he actually costs more food than anybody else, but he gives you a free blacksmith. That's what the arsenal wagon is. Uh, you get that free arsenal, which you know has some critical technologies in them, and uh, bonus military units. So in the long run, that's a really solid politician right there. Or if you need more intel, you could go with the inventor, and he gives you the hot air balloon bonus for your explorer, which is pretty nice. I'll pick wood in this case. Hello? But I'm teching up the next level here. So I've selected my politician, and I'm going to be getting that 400 wood. Every civilization has a different set of politicians going up the ages. So you have a different set of possible bonuses each for each different uh, civilization. Even civilizations that share politicians are often different. Like the logistician for France, I believe, is different than the logistician for Germany, or the one for Spain is different. Uh, that kind of thing. They're going to look different. So, every civilization has these really unique opportunities, these really unique uh, timing attacks that are built into their age up. So how do you use the resources you collect from your treasure camps? How do you use the resources you collect from your, uh, you know, your politicians? Those are critical parts of the game. Now, tied in with that, I'm going to some houses real quick. I'll, I'll briefly even mention the revolution upgrade. Imagine that you are playing Age of Empires 2 and you're in the Castle Age, right? And you have the resources. You could go up to the Imperial Age. Or you could research this diet Imperial technology, which gives you, uh, you know, access to trebuchets and your unique unit elite upgrade. It's a cheaper... Uh, technology, it researches faster, but it locks you out of everything else. Uh, age of uh, everything else for age four, you know, you're locked out. That's kind of what the revolution tech does. In Age of Empires three, when you're in the, um, I'm forgetting the name of it off the top of my head. When you're in the fourth age and you have the opportunity to go up to the fifth age, you can instead select a revolution. 
And for those civs that have revolutions, they have different revolutions, different possibilities, uh, each with their own pros and cons. So they're really exciting. And they do that kind of thing where they give you either a really strong, powerful timing attack military-wise, all in military aggression, or maybe it's a really strong economic boom. Uh, but whatever you select, pros and cons, it locks you out of that final age up normally. So it's a pretty unique uh, option that's available to some civilizations. Timing attacks are everything in Age of Empires 3. Now, um, something else that we should talk about... Put my... I think the next thing that we want to talk about is the economy or the actual like resources of the game because what you'll probably notice is that there are uh, some different there's some differences from Age of Empires 2 you'll notice that there's no stone so things like watchtowers and walls are actually built with wood and gold in some cases uh, so that's definitely a little different but there are four resources in this game you say, what are you talking about? I see food, I see wood, I see gold. What else is there? There's also what's called experience. And experience is earned with just about everything in the game. Uh, experience is earned by building buildings, collecting resources, defeating enemy units. Um, just anything that you're doing, you're earning experience. Uh, I think the church, which is pretty cool, the church gives you a slow trickle of experience. So that's a good one to get. But probably the biggest, most important way of... Probably the biggest way of getting experience in the game is by building trading posts on these trade routes. And you'll see caravans that drive by. And whenever the caravan drives by your trading post, you will gain experience. Now what does experience do? Well, we haven't even yet talked about the biggest difference between Age of Empires 2 and Age of Empires 3, and the one that is maybe the most exciting, but also the most challenging to understand out of the gate, which is the home city shipment card system. All right, so let me build some more houses real quick. As you collect experience, and you'll see it's in the upper left-hand corner of this wheel here, you collect experience and you're earning these points. And these points are shipments. And if we click on the wheel, You'll see that you can select a deck. Now, before the game even starts, you can build... You, you, you start with a couple of free decks. But you can build yourself as many decks as you want uh, for different situations in the game. So I might have a deck for, uh, you know, team games, a deck for 1v1s, a deck for uh, water maps, a deck for land maps. You can build as many decks as you want. Um, but you select a deck. And once you select a deck, you're locked in. And each deck has a set of cards associated with them. The cards are locked behind the different ages. Age 1, 2, 3, and 4. And what you do is... You spend your shipment points in order to send these cards. The cards take a little bit of time, but then they will arrive on the map to help you out. You can actually... This is kind of cute. You can actually see the crossbowmen that I just selected walking across the field. And they're going to get into the boat and you know, make their way to my base. So... Um, cards give you a lot of really interesting opportunities. You can send bonus villagers. And for you Age of Empires 2 players, you know how important your economy is. So getting your economy going and sending villagers is huge. You can send military units either to help defend your base or to assist in going on the offense. You can send resources. You can send uh, certain stat bonuses like uh, cheaper trading posts or... Uh, faster moving units or faster training units, right? Even certain buildings or technologies can be locked behind uh, your your decks. Uh, once again, every civilization has a different set of possible cards that you can assort and build your deck out of. And it makes for a really fun, exciting, you know, aspect of the game. Uh, but that's why experience is very important. You want to make sure that you... Uh, let's see here. I need more, more houses. So, fighting for experience. Uh, map control is even more important in Age of Empires 3 than Age of Empires 2. It's important in Age 2. It really is. But it's even more important in Age of Empires 3. Because 
Um, again, the game is won or lost on things like which player is gathering more experience. And um, yeah, there we go. Some of these guys. Once we get a crossbow, we're going to actually move out and do a little bit of fighting. So, yeah, map control, vitally important. Making sure that you are on top of gathering uh, experience and, you know, making sure that you're selecting the right kinds of cards. Uh, you know, that's a vital part of the game. And it's a lot of fun, but it is very different from what we're used to as AoE 2 players. One of the things that's important to maybe bring up economically, and this is actually good to talk about as I'm building a farm right here, is um, farms work... Let me, let me back up. You are never going to have a late-game post-imperial trash war phase like you do in Age of Empires 2. The reason for that is farms, once they're built, you, they don't cost any more wood. It's a one-time payment of wood, and then they are gathering food forever. Uh, there are buildings called estates, which you can build, that do the same thing for gold. And in the late game, you can build, um, if I pull up my deck, there are these things called factories that some, some uh, civilizations have access to that are kind of like Portuguese feitorias. They provide a constant trickle of whatever resource you want. In the late game, trading posts, uh, actually, right now, I can switch them from experience to wood, food, or gold. Yeah. So, you're almost Which always, if, if you plan your economy right, you will always have access to all of the resources of the game. Right? Uh, so you don't necessarily have the situation where you're falling back on pikemen and skirmishers and scouts because you, you've lost the ability to, to you know, build gold units. That doesn't happen in Age of Empires. It can happen. There are times where you have to adapt to your economic reality, but it's not an everyday thing. You know, it's uh, if you're planning your economy right and you're defending your base right, uh, you should be able to have access to all of the resources and you can build your best units throughout the game until somebody wins or loses. Right? So that's important to know economically. And I think that hits the highlights of the economic differences. I mean, the only other thing I could bring up is you've probably noticed that there aren't things like uh, lumber camps or mining camps. When you select a villager and you tell them to work on a resource, they act like Khmer farmers. They just provide you a slow trickle of resources um, directly from whatever they're working on. And you can see up here, not just the resources, but the uh, per minute gathering of resources, which is a pretty nice bonus. Um... Yeah. Let's see. You guys should maybe get on wood. No. Gold. Yeah, richtig. <clears throat> okay, so I think that pretty much highlights the uh, economic differences between the two games. Now, what about the military difference? Well, one thing that I want to highlight quickly, because I think we're actually going to see this in just a second, is the tempo of the game is much faster in Age of Empires 3 than it is in Age of Empires 2. What do I mean by that? Well, is that what I... Look, look, look at him taunting me. Uh, buildings go down much faster in Age of Empires 3 than they do in Age of Empires 2. And you see here, I'm in the second age. This would be the, uh, the feudal age of Age of Empires 3, right? And in Age of Empires 2, you could never win a game this way. You, know, you could not wipe out an opponent like this. Um, you normally, you know, you if you have a good raid in the feudal age, you cripple an opponent's economy, and then you go up into the castle age and you get out, you know, siege, and you can actually destroy an enemy's town center uh, with siege in uh, in the third age. But in Age of Empires II, uh, buildings are not nearly as resistant to unit fire as they are in Age. I'm sorry, as they are in Age Two. So in H3, if you get up a large enough mass of units, you can end the game in the second age. And you can build a deck 
around getting units out quickly and knocking opponents out of the game right away in age two. Uh, and we're, we're going to see that here where, you know, my opponent's town center is going down pretty quickly. I had you know, 48 crossbowmen here. And, yeah, this TC, you know, won't last. I find that it's more important to defend your base with military units in H3 than it is in H2. It's harder to rely on, you know, watchtowers or town centers or even castles. Um, yeah, that's a good point. Even castles in this game, they're called fortresses. But, you know, even fortresses in this game go down very quickly to units. If one player has a big mass of units and the other doesn't, you're going to lose, even more in H3 than in H2. So that's one thing that's worth talking about is the tempo is different. So there we go. I just, I beat my one opponent, and uh, that gives us a little bit of time to work on the second, the second one. So, all right, now we can go ahead and go up to the next stage. And the other thing that's maybe important to talk about combat-wise, and I think part of what makes Age of Empires 3 very daunting to Age of Empires 2 players is all of the unique units in the game. I mean, in Age of Empires 3, I'm sorry, in Age of Empires 2, you have one, maybe two unique units per civ. And the unique unit is almost always found in the castle. You build a castle and you get your Teutonic Knight or your Latus or whatever, right? But in Age of Empires 3, unique units are strewn all over the place. You've got, uh, in the case of the Germans, I've got uh, Doppelsoldners in my barracks, and I have uh, war wagons in my stables. And, you know, I've got, you know, just, just all of these hosts of different unique units everywhere you look, right? And then you've got these uh, uh, native camps where you can... Oh, that's cool. So you've got these native camps where you can build, you know, unique units from units on the map, like the Cherokee here are going to provide me Cherokee unique units, which are pretty cool. And there's like, there's so many unique units, you start losing your mind over what all these units do. Well, the good news is the game is actually relatively straightforward. And it makes sense if you look at this combat wheel. If you're looking at the map, the, the, the wheel here, what you'll see is that there are five different general types of units. We've got two kinds of infantry, heavy infantry and light infantry, and two kinds of cavalry, heavy cavalry and light cavalry. And then we have artillery. And the way it breaks down is, is you have heavy infantry like the musketeer, which is your pretty standard vanilla unit, uh, vanilla heavy infantry. And they are very good all around infantry units that do a very good job of taking out cavalry, both heavy cavalry and light cavalry. They can do it. Light infantry, like the skirmisher, or in this case, actually, the crossbowman counts too, uh, are infantry units that are very good at taking out heavy infantry and light cavalry. You have heavy cavalry, like the hussar, that are very good at taking out... Um, uh, let me see. Heavy infantry... I'm sorry, heavy cavalry are very good at taking out light infantry and artillery. You have light cavalry, which is almost always ranged cavalry. So if you see a cavalry unit using a gun or a bow, pretty much guaranteed it's light cavalry. And the light cavalry is very good at taking out heavy cavalry, or any kind of cavalry, really, and uh, artillery. And then you have artillery, which is very good at taking out either heavy or light infantry. Particularly artillery such as the falconet or the uh, heavy cannon. There are other kinds of artillery pieces like the culverin, which is an anti-artillery artillery unit, and the mortar, which is an anti-building artillery unit. But, for the most part, all of the units in the game will fit into this wheel right here that we're looking at. So, uh, anytime you're looking at a unit, and, and you can click on a unit, like in this case, the crossbowman here. You click on him, and you, you know, mouse over the portrait, and it will tell you if you don't know. Okay, this is an example of light infantry, right? Uh, or, hey, this is an example of 
If I pull up my Hussar, are any of them still alive? Yeah. I don't think so. I think I lost them all. But, you know, if I were to, to build my um, Ulan, is actually the, the Germans, they don't have Hussar, they have Ulans. But the Ulan is an example of heavy cavalry. You know, and, I, and you can just mouse over his portrait, and you'd be able to tell at a glance, okay, this is, you know, heavy cavalry, right? So, uh, any any unit in the game fits into this combat wheel, right? And so, that helps make a lot of sense. I mean, when you're fighting against the Mexicans, and they have insurgentes and soldados, or you're you're playing the Russians, and they've got strelets and Cossacks, and you're getting confused at all of these units. What are they? Well, they they all have their unique bonuses and features. Things like the Haudenosaunee's uh, Forest Prowler is a skirmisher that has a stealth function. Uh, the Strelet is the Russian skirmisher that is very, very, very cheap. So sometimes they have unique abilities or unique bonuses, um, unique costs. They're going to be different, but as far as their basic function, they fit into this combat wheel. Right? So, Hopefully, that makes some sense. Now, let's see. Oh, and one other thing briefly, because uh, this will come up. If you're playing against a certain Native American civilizations, um, like the Aztec, for example, they have the Chimu Runner. I believe it's the Aztec that have the Chimu Runner, but uh, you'll see some infantry called Shock Infantry. And they are for civilizations that don't have access to cavalry. They're kind of eagle warrior of Age of Empires 3. And they fit into that heavy cavalry category. They have the same kinds of strengths and weaknesses, more or less, as heavy cavalry do. So, just want to flag that for you in case you ever run into uh, you know, shock infantry like them. They don't get countered by the usual infantry counters. They count as heavy cav and get countered in that way. So I've already talked about tempo, and, and an aspect of that too is, um, ooh, let me get the crossbow and upgrade, that would be a good idea. So we've already talked about the tempo, and you can, de you can defeat an enemy in the second age. You don't need siege units in order to destroy an enemy, although it helps. It helps to have artillery to wipe out enemy infantry forces. It helps to destroy buildings even faster by having siege. So it's good to have, but you don't need them in order to win the game, right? Um, consequently, there are five ages in the game, not four. And the spikes from age one to two to three to four to five are not quite as strong as in Age of Empires uh, two, with the jumps up from age one to two to three to four. They are there, they're strong, but they're not quite as strong, right? I think maybe the last tip that I want to give is, and I'll start moving my units out to maybe try to bring this game to a close. Because I think here I've got the guard crossbowman now. Ooh, I, I could get that imperial crossbowman upgrade. Hmm. Why not? Let's go ahead and, and revolt to Grand Colombia. So when I do this, all of my villagers will become... Uh, revolutionaries. Alright, let's go guys. Aid in the attack. And then uh, my deck changes to the unique uh, Grand Columbia deck, which is pretty cool. Right, here we go. And hopefully we win the game here. If, if we lose, that'll be a little embarrassing. But, um, yeah, there we go. We're winning pretty handily. But I think what I've done is I've shared here some of the basics of just what makes the game unique combat-wise, what makes it unique um, you know, as far as economy goes, and just the general feel of the game. Of course, some of the real complexities of how the game is played, kind of like in Age of Empires 2 with how important monks can be in the right circumstance, or mangonels, and that sort of thing. It's the sort of thing that you explore over time um, you know, as you're actually playing a game against other people at your skill level. It's, it's a fun thing to explore and learn. Here we go. Here, here are the Independence Guard. 
which are my revolutionary units. I have no economy at home. This is kind of like the Burgundians. We're all in on the offense here. Um, the last thing I would say is, even more than in Age of Empires 2, Age of Empires 3 civilizations are extremely unique. The difference between the Britons and the Franks in Age of Empires 2, it's even worse in Age of Empires 3 between the, uh, the French and the British, right? The unique units, the unique abilities, the, the, uh, the strategies that are available, it's wildly different. And so, you know, I kind of want to highlight that. Uh, in Age of Empires 3, I almost see them like uh, characters in a fighting game. Where, if you're playing a fighting game, Street Fighter or whatever, you need to take a lot of time to learn your own character and learn their unique moves, their abilities, that kind of thing. But then you also need to learn... and try to end the game here. But you don't need to just learn that. You also need to learn, you know, you, you gotta take time to learn your own character's moveset and you're, you know, you're, you're spending time training to figure all of that out. And then you need to spend time figuring out the moveset of your opponent and what they're good at and what they're bad at. It just takes a lot of trial and error. It's a lot of fun. It's, it's different. It's a little bit more complex. Again, in Age of Empires 2, if you learn something like the Saracens, you've learned most of the cast, and the the bonuses are a little bit more subtle. It takes some real skill and experience to draw out the differences in the differences. In Age of Empires 3, it's a lot more pronounced. And that makes it a fun experience. Here we go. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and get my economy at home, you know, building back up, just in case, because, you know, I'm pretty sure my opponent is rather handily defeated, but, you know, we don't need to give him the chance to come back. Yeah, so just taking the time to learn your own civilizations, bonuses, and, and features, and how they play, and then taking the time to learn the unique qualities of each and every other civilization in the game. It's exciting, it's different. Every Civ is very unique. They feel, you know, really special to play. So, it's fun. It's a lot of fun. I think that pretty much wraps it up for my advice on, on playing AOE 3. This game is more or less over. Any second now, Padre Miguel will go ahead and surrender. I hope this video helps you out, uh, helps you understand and get into Age of Empires 3. It's a really fun game. It's an absolute blast to play. As of this recording, it's actually on sale. Uh, pretty cheap on the Steam store. So, uh, And I'm sure it's probably on sale in the Microsoft store too. But um, you know, if you want, go ahead and pick it up. It is a lot of fun. The devs have done an amazing job keeping it updated and releasing new civilizations for it. A new expansion came out just last month. So uh, the, the Knights of the Mediterranean, at least in the Maltese and the, in, uh, the Italians. So uh, they're doing a really good job. It's a lot of fun to play. I'm wanting to put some Age of Empires 3 videos on the channel, some multiplayer games. Uh, I think it'll be a lot of fun. So I hope you guys enjoy it. Uh, if you like AOE 2 or RTS in general, give it a shot. I don't think you'll regret it. Um, if you've got any questions about Age of Empires 3, or maybe you're a fan of the game and you think of something that maybe I forgot to mention in the video, feel free to leave a comment below. I'd uh, love to share a, a conversation on that. Um, if you liked the video, please go ahead and hit the like button. And uh, Again, if you like this Age of Empires 3 content, like the video, subscribe to the channel. That means a lot to me. Um, other than that, that's pretty much it. I'm looking forward to sharing more, but for now, this is it. This is the Iron Kaiser signing off. You know what? I'm not. You can feel free to stop the video now if you want, but if you're the kind of guy like me sometimes who's like, I can't believe you got that close to ending the game, and you know why would you stop the video just before the game, you know, hits close? 
I understand you. I'm with you. And the last bit of this video is for you, okay? So, we're just going to go ahead and knock out the contestants here. Alright, what we need... Ready. Yes. Commandment. I, yeah. I, was. I got some mercenaries. That's another part of the game. I don't have this in the script. I don't... You know, I wasn't planning on talking about them, but... I've already mentioned the native camps. Another way that you have timing attacks, these mercenary units. So they're like elite versions of regular units that cost a lot of gold, but only gold. And um, I think the Harkabus is an example of a mercenary unit. Although he didn't cost gold because it was a revolutionary tech kind of thing. But learning to use military, uh, uh, mercenary units, and when should I go for a mercenary strategy, or you know, when should I use mercenaries instead of my regular army? That's something that I'm still trying to figure out myself. You know, I don't really have an answer to that. Okay, Padre Miguel, where are you exactly? Are you? It might be that he's claimed this. Yeah, he might. This came out in the patch just today, which is really cool. If you hover over the uh, the settlement, you'll see what kind of units uh, the settlement builds. And uh, when you click on you click on the camp, it'll show you in a distance. Okay, you can build these things. That's pretty good. So you just send military units over. You send military units over, and then you can just build. Uh, Spend the resources and automatically claim the game. Which is pretty cool. I was putting together a mod that would have shown that information. And I would like to think, I don't know if it's true or not, but I would like to believe that actually some of the devs saw the mod and thought, hey, that's a great idea. Why don't why don't I go ahead and why don't we go ahead and just put that in the game proper? I'd like to believe that was the case. Or maybe maybe, you know. Genius is thinking like whatever it is. Uh, da, 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 da. Where the dock? I bet you it's the dock. Go go right there. It's the dock for sure. All right. We don't need to destroy houses. We need to destroy the docks. Hello, Interesting that my. Citizens are still speaking German, even though they've revolted to Colombia. Or right. Grand Colombia. <sighs> Notice on the trading posts, you have these technologies. This is kind of cool. You got these technologies that make the trade routes go faster, right? So you can gain more experience or whatever resource you're, you've selected. Um, you can gain more from the trading post. Here's the thing, though, is everyone on the trade route benefits, and um, only one player can research it. So let's say that you are, you know, um, let's say that it's a 1v1, right? And I've got two of the trading posts, and my opponent has two of the trading posts on the same route. Some maps have different routes, like multiple routes. There's only one route here. So, we, you know, my enemy has two, I've got two, and then I spend the resources to get the root upgrade. Well, my opponent doesn't have to spend the resources, it's no longer available to him, and uh, he benefits from the tech just as much as I do, because we both have two trading posts. So that's a little bit of a fun thing you have to run into. Okay, where are you? I need to go ahead and get out some Ulans. Let me see. I'm gonna. So marketplaces. Uh, you might be wondering, like, well, if you don't have lumber camps or mining camps, where do you get your economic upgrades, right? Um, most of them, especially for the one, the stuff you do on the map, uh, you find in the market. So things like. Uh, you can collect from gold mines faster. You can collect from um, deer faster. That kind of thing. Here we go. Yeah. Collect from wild animals faster with uh, hunting dogs. You cut down trees faster with gang saw. You collect uh, coin from mines faster. 
your villagers have more hit points and your villagers attack a little bit better. You know, with these two techs. So that's where you go for those sorts of technologies. If you've got a mill or an estate, you find their upgrades in, you know, at the mill. Do I have access to a cap? Yeah. See, normally, if I'd hit age 5, I could have thrown down a capital, and then I could uh, research spies, essentially, at the capital. But because I, I went with the revolution, that is not an option. Yeah, learning how to use mercenaries, and then native camps, too. So the Seminole Bowman is... Um, and it says Native American Archer with a short range and high attack, right? So it's, it's basically like my crossbowman. But the cool thing about Native Native units, whether they are Indian units or uh, Asian, whatever, I mean, European, it doesn't matter. The, the Native camp units is their population is separate from your pop limits. So, you know, I've got a limit of 200, just like in Age of Empires 2. But... My native units have a separate population limit of 16. So I could have 200 Colombian units and then 16 Seminole units. Or yeah. Seminole Bowman or whatever. Right? Jeez Louise, where are these guys? I do not believe for a second that the only thing... I'm going to destroy these houses and just hope that drops the score enough for the AI to finally surrender. Hey. Oh, cool. Okay, because I revolted as Columbia, uh, I got access to two ironclads. Yeah. Ironclads, two of them, versus... Mexican fishing ship, go. You'll also notice that... There we go. There it is, game over. I was just going to say, too, looking at the Ironclad, some units, like the Ironclad, have not just stances, which are important. Uh, stances are important, where... Like, if you have the Musketeer, and you want to take advantage of their melee attack, which does bonus damage versus cavalry, you can switch them into melee mode in order to, you know, f have them pull out their swords and fight like that. Um, they have stances, which are important. Maybe even more important than AoE, too. But some units, like the Ironclad, actually have abilities. Not often, but sometimes. Like, this one is a great anti-building, long-range... It's kind of like a cannon galleon in AoE, too. Right, or like your explorer, you start the game with a uh, one-hit kill shot on treasure guardians, and uh, in the fourth age, you get another one, which is a, a shot that you can use against infantry or cavalry from your opponent. Anyway, that covers it for this video. Thanks for watching, guys. Again, if you would like, comment, subscribe, those things mean a lot to me. I really appreciate it. Thanks. I'll catch you around.